see me, you Stevie. Wondering how I reach more evolutions than Eevee and make it look easy. What's up, Birds of Mightiest subscribers? It's Blur Without Fear. Welcome back to the channel. Today's video, I'm going to be talking about the new Wildcat series by Matthew Rosenberg and Steven Segovia. This is a weird one for me because this actually takes me all the way back to when I was like 10 years old. Back in the early 90s, Brandon Choi and Jim Lee created Wildcats, which at the time, the cats in Wildcats was an acronym for Covert Action Teams. This was all back in 1992 where teams like Youngblood and Stormwatch were a big deal, not to mention Todd McFarlane's Spawn. Fast forward through many different relaunches through not just Image Comics, but also when everything shifted over to Wildstorm. Ever since Jim Lee left Image Comics back in 1998 and sold Wildstorm over to DC Comics, Wildcats has technically been a part of the DC Comics imprint, albeit everything that was Wildstorm was editorially kept separate from everything that was DC Comics, which is why you didn't really see the Wildcats or you know any other characters from Wildstorm as a major part of anything going on with DC Comics at the time. You didn't just see them palling around with the Justice League, so on and so forth. And about around the time of 2010, Wildstorm had largely fallen off from DC Comics. I mean, it was still a thing, but there wasn't really much from Wildstorm that DC was using. Fast forward to 2017, DC tried to give Wildstorm a resurgence, and while that was met with mostly positive results, I feel, it's in the recent year that DC has brought back Wildstorm, I won't necessarily say with a vengeance, but with more of a quiet sneak attack. Right now, the Wildcats, once a covert action team, they are now a crisis aversion tactical squad. It's mostly the same members you might remember if you're more familiar with the original Image series or any of its later iterations under Wildstorm. One thing that is still in place, but is not quite the main focus of the first two issues that are out currently, is the shadow war between the Carabim and the Daemonites. For those unfamiliar, the original Wildcat series focused heavily on these two alien species war for existence, with the Daemonites being the de facto bad guys and the Carabim in many ways being similar to Marvel Comics mutants. This was not subtle in any way, shape, form, or fashion as many of you may remember. At the time that Wildcats was coming out, Jim Lee had recently been working on X-Men. And while the similarities between the Carabim and the mutants aren't necessarily like a one-to-one -one thing, because obviously the Carabim are an alien race, as opposed to being humans born with mutant powers, there were still a lot of similarities between the Wildcats and the X-Men. But as of the first two issues of Wildcats under Matthew Rosenberg and Steven Segovia, Damonites have really only been mentioned a couple of times. This iteration of the team, we have OG Wildcats member Cole Cash, aka Grifter, the bandana mask wearing, gun toting, one time telekinetic, and who knows if that's a thing anymore character, who was originally the disaffected bad boy of the team and is still that, but is now more of a Hawkeye type of leader where he's not necessarily bad at being a merc or even being a leader, but he's just messy and just seems to always have crappy luck. I know some people are gonna immediately jump on how Cole is musing with other people about how he and the rest of his team come from a universe where all of DC's superheroes turned into zombies. I honestly think a lot of that is bullshit. I think he's just making something up. I mean, to be fair, if that is the case, if he is in fact telling the truth, then that would make the story even that much more interesting. But based on Cole's nickname and that he is a liar, that he lies most of the time, I'm gonna go on and say this isn't true. But if it does turn out to be true, it'd be hella funny. We also have the return of OG Wildcats member Zana, aka Zealot, a Caribou martial arts master and highly skilled warrior who was a character that could easily be described as humorless as she was deadly, but now seems to have a bit more of a sense of humor and might even be more deadly if that was even possible. Back in the day, a lot of X-Men fans used to compare her to Psylocke. We also have the return of another Wildcats OG, Maxine Manchester, AKA Ladytron, a cyborg with a metric boatload of enhancements and weaponry built into her body and was one of the team's later additions back in 1995. And her trademark was being borderline psychotic and quick to jump into a fight. This version seems more cool, calm, and collected and far more articulate than the original. And 
very spicy to boot. We also see the return of Void, one of the other OGs of the 90s era Wildcats, who is for all intents and purposes a teleporting space god, and the team's main method of transportation, and yes, she is still as cryptic now as she was before. That said, she's also seemingly sporting a skull head nowadays that's barely visible behind the visor of her containment suit. We also see the return of Voodoo, who is also around and still seems to be a somewhat powerful psionic, able to sense daemonites as well as get psychic impressions from objects and places that she touches and can sense when others are nearby. She doesn't do much in the early goings of this series, but I'm happy to see that Voodoo's ethnic ambiguity is less ambiguous under Matthew Rosenberg and Steven Segovia's penmanship. There's also a couple of members on the team who are from the Image Comics and Wildstorm days of yore that you may or may not be familiar with. Characters who were popular in their own right, but were never really considered quotey fingers Wildcats. We've got Michael Cray, aka Deathblow, a huge staple at Image Comics back in the early 90s. Originally a psychokinetic big gun Tony Merc with a healing factor, is now just a regular man with big guns and a bad attitude who has become leader of this ragtag band of killers for now. In a move that is seemingly a reference to Death Blow by Blows from 1999 by Alan Moore, it is later revealed he's actually not quite a regular man. This time around, he ends up getting completely smoked, sent to the Gulag in issue number one, but don't worry, he's a clone slash cyborg nowadays and gets a new body whenever he dies, albeit when we're reintroduced to the character in issue number two, it's a female body, not unlike the Death Blow by Blow series I mentioned earlier. It definitely makes things interesting between Cole and Michael Cray because, you know, originally when Cole was hanging out with Death Blow, the character was male. Now the character is female, and Cole is unabashedly attracted to Death Blow now. So things are gonna get really interesting. One of the other characters you'll be reintroduced to is a clone of former leader and member of Gen 13, Caitlin Fairchild, or just Fairchild as most people typically called her. She was the super genius and the big bad muscle of Gen 13 back in the 90s. A character who possessed superhuman strength, speed, durability, and stamina, and for all intents and purposes was on similar power levels as Marvel She-Hulk. But as I mentioned earlier, the version of Fairchild we see in this comic is a clone, not the original Fairchild. As a matter of fact, she lives up to her namesake as she is still just a child, seemingly being only a preteen or teenager at best, but much as I mentioned earlier, the comparisons between the original Fairchild and She-Hulk, this version of the character can transform into that older version of the original Fairchild, complete with superhuman capabilities, but the difference being that she can only transform into this state for a very short while. As far as we've recently seen, only for a handful of seconds, maybe even a minute. She can only maintain the form for so long before the adrenaline rush that using her powers gives her causes her to crash and pass out. I'm thinking somewhere down the road, we'll eventually see where she gets past this limitation. Now, another character we also see the return of is Jacob Marlowe. Originally codenamed Lord Imp is no longer codenamed Lord Imp or is even referred to as the Imp because problematic. Though who knows, they may start calling him the Imp again, we just haven't heard them say it yet. But the Halo Corporation that Jacob Marlowe owned from the original series is back up and running with DC Comics villains like Tio Maro, Professor Ivo, as well as Mr. Freeze's ex-wife Nora Fields, aka Mrs. Freeze, Percival Stutter, aka Dr. Time, running different divisions within the Halo Corporation and helping make Jacob Marlowe a metric crap ton of monies. Jacob is still, for all intents and purposes, the handler and official leader of the Wildcats. He's the one who dictates what their missions are, where they go, and for all intents and purposes is also there to bust the Wildcats chops whenever they screw up a mission. And right now, the entire team's job is to take down threats 
to the world that could result in a crisis situation. You know, the same crises we see all the time in the DC Comics universe. Whether or not they're good or bad at their job is entirely up to the reader to determine for themselves. But in my estimation, the reason the DC universe doesn't remember or know who the Wildcats are is because they actually are particularly good at their job, at least up until we get halfway through issue number one, where Cole is thrust into being the leader. The Wildcats, initially having been set up in DC Comics' Gotham City, have now moved to Green Arrow's backyard of Star City, and trust me, we do actually see a cameo by Green Arrow in the first issue alone. We even see cameos by other characters like Nightwing and Batgirl when they show up to a scene where the Wildcats have thrown down with somebody only to get there right as the Wildcats are leaving, with the only exception being Green Arrow, who actually shows up in the middle of one of the Wildcats' operations, and where Oliver Queen is usually seen as a more lovable and affable character, in this situation, he just assumes that the Wildcats are bad guys and tries to kill them. That's my green arrow right there. But once again, as you'd imagine, these guys are supposed to be a clandestine team, but now that we're following their journey as a crisis aversion team that's supposed to operate in secret, it just so happens now they're starting to be bad at their job and the world discovers who they really are. When they run afoul of the Court of Owls, the Court of Owls, in an effort of retaliation, leak information about Grifter and Zealot having operated in Gotham City. More recently, they've been appearing in issues like Batman Urban Legends, which is largely what these first two issues are referring to sometimes when they bring up that Zealot and Grifter have run afoul of Batman. But now that the world knows the Wildcats exist and that they might be connected to the Halo Corporation, Jacob Marlowe introduces a new team called the Seven Soldiers of Victory. If that name sounds familiar, that's because the Seven Soldiers of Victory were a team that used to operate back in the 40s at Legendary Comics and then would later become a part of the DC Comics stable. But under DC Comics, that was a team that used to showcase characters like the Shiny Knight, the Star Spangled Kid, and Stripesy, as well as the Crimson Avenger and Green Arrow and Speedy. Well, now he has revived this team with an entirely new roster, largely made up of classic Wildcats characters. If you were at any point asking yourself, well, where are characters like Maul and Spartan and Warblade? And so on and so forth. Well, this is kind of where you get them. Well, for the most part. Marla was still keeping the Wildcats off the books, but the Seven Soldiers of Victory are supposed to be the face of Halo Corporation, at least in terms of superhero teams. Characters like Spartan have been hiding in plain sight as his alias John Colt, otherwise known as Jan Cole, operating as Marlowe's chief of security and personal bodyguard. And in Wildcats number one and two, we never really see him in a costume, but he's always nearby and is also present when Jacob Marlowe unveils the team, albeit once again, not in any costume. The real question is whether or not he's still an android which he very likely is. We also see that the character Maul is also present, still big and purple as always with the horns coming out of his back. The real question here is whether or not his ability to grow in mass still has the weakness of his brain not growing with his body, leading to him becoming as dumb as a stump the bigger he gets. And while Warblade is nowhere to be found, we do see former Wildcats villain Pike, a highly skilled Caribbean hybrid military strategist and murderer mercenary who used to work with the Daemonites, this time sporting a cape. We also see the character Mr. Majestic, a one-time leader of the Wildcats, who is for all intents and purposes the Superman of the Wildstorm universe, at least in terms of powers and abilities, but unlike Superman, has no issue whatsoever using his power to the fullest extent, even on normal people. He's also on the team. There's no Warblade on the team as far as I'm aware, and there's a couple of other characters on the team who I'm not terribly familiar with, so I'm pretty sure if I actually sat down, went back, and reread some of the older Wildcats comics, I would probably recognize them to some degree or another. I'm also pretty sure that some of these characters may even be related to other titles that were part of Wildstorm, stuff like Team 7, Wetworks, so on and so forth. I would not be surprised if I found out any of this information to be true in any way, shape, form, or fashion. All in all, this is an amazing book so far. This is one of those deals where like something I've been thinking about, something that's been on my mind for quite some time is Wildcats. I had actually gone back not that long ago and had been rereading the first trade of Wildcats not that long ago. So this is something that was like fresh on my head. I was actually really looking forward to this coming out and I kind of forgot about it. And then suddenly I was like, oh crap, issue number two's out. And I was like, you know what, let's talk about it. So 
here we are. But anyways, let me know what you think about Matthew Rosenberg and Steven Segovia's new Wildcats series. Were you a fan of the original Wildcats or are you today years old finding out about them? Keep it plus ultra and sound off in the comments.